Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I'm delighted uh, today to welcome you to the Ubiquity University Great Books uh, course. We're starting a new trimester, and uh, so for the next uh, two months, we're going to be considering two books. One is the great work by Shanti Deva, The Way of the Bodhisattva, and the second one that we'll take up in July and August is Plutarch. Uh, the lives of the noble Greeks and Romans. And so I want to launch uh, into Shanti Deva today. But for those students who are, who are with us, I want to just note that I've changed the lives of the uh, Greeks and Romans from Plutarch. Uh, originally, I was going to uh, talk about Theseus, the founder of Athens, and Romulus, the founder of Rome. But under current circumstances, particularly here in the United States, where we have a, a tyrant, essentially, uh, a demagogue um, who is uh, upsetting the constitutional balances of power and threatening um, the integrity of the Republic of the United States of America, uh, I thought it would be worth looking at Alcibiades in ancient Athens. He was the one who principally was responsible for leading Athens into the disastrous war uh, with Sparta, the Peloponnesian War. Uh, and then in the course of that war, he did so much to destabilize Athens, eventually fighting for the Spartans, and then fighting for the Persians against Athens, uh, that he contributed a lot to the demise of the Athenian Empire. And then with Sulla uh, in the first century BC in ancient Rome, and out of the turbulence that was gripping Rome in the late Republic, uh, it was Sulla that emerged as a strong man and uh, was principally uh, the uh, individual responsible uh, for the demise of the Roman Republic. And I wanna raise these issues because uh, I wanna make the point that constitutional systems, democracies are very fragile and they rely ultimately on civility on a common understanding of what's right and what's good. And when someone comes in that wantonly violates all these norms, they're sometimes very difficult to stop and they often end up destroying the very system that brought them to power. So that's what I'll be taking up in uh, uh, July and August, but for May and June, we're gonna take up uh, Shanti Deva uh, and his work, The Way of the Bodhisattva, which is one of the most sublime works of Buddhism. And it's all intentional. Uh, May, as many of you may know, is the month, the full moon in May, uh, is the time where the Lord Buddha was born. And then again in the fu full moon in May, uh, he gained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. And then again, on the full moon of May, uh, he passed into Nirvana at the age of 80. And I want to start uh, by honoring the Buddha, uh, who I have studied and reverenced uh, since I was five years old. I had my uh, first uh, numinous or spiritual experience as the son of a Baptist missionary. Uh, in Taiwan, uh, wandering into a Buddhist temple one day, uh, sitting a, uh, seeing a, a, a monk sitting on the floor facing the statue of the Buddha, and the monk was as motionless as the statue. And I crept along to the side of him and couldn't quite figure out why he wasn't moving. 
And then as I was watching him, a fly came and settled on his forehead and crawled across his forehead. And the monk didn't move. And the fly flew away. And then I'll never forget, a fly came back and started to crawl across his lips down into his chin. And that monk didn't move a muscle. He was completely still. And all of a sudden, in my little boy mind, I realized that this monk was somewhere else and that he had attained a depth of awareness and understanding that I knew nothing about. And uh, that experience changed my life. And I, when I was in my early 20s, I started to meditate, started to do yoga, uh, and I meditate to the present day. And as I look back on my life, I often think of that one small, short incident on a summer morning and uh, how it has shaped virtually everything that I have become as a spiritual seeker, trying to get to that place of quiet and equanimity beyond the flickerings of a fly. And uh, so I, I, uh, I've always loved Buddhism. I've always loved the Eastern metaphysical traditions. I love uh, uh, commenting on uh, Lao Tzu and uh, the various Buddhist texts. Uh, and today it's, uh, it's a real pleasure for me uh, to uh, comment in my own small, insignificant way uh, against the vastness, the ocean that is Shantideva. Let's start with the Buddha. Uh, the Buddha was one of the most extraordinary human beings uh, ever to live. If you think about how most of us live our lives, <laughs> we want money, we want success, uh, we want that iPhone, we not want the car, we want wealth, probably more than anything, so that we can live comfortably. Uh, we want to be able to have material blessings, we want to eat good food, we, we want a happy life largely defined by material existence. We want friendships. Buddha had everything that most of us spend our entire lives seeking to attain. Everything. He was the son of a king. He was the firstborn prince set to inherit the throne. He was exceedingly handsome. He was unusually intelligent. He recalls that uh, he had three palaces, and in the palaces were three ponds, one with blue lilies, one with red lilies, and one with white lilies. At the age of 16, he was given in marriage to the most beautiful maiden in the land. And they had a son, Rahula. And he lived a life of ease, wealth, power, and comfortability. And what he came to understand is that everything we spend our lives desperately trying to achieve essentially mean nothing in the face of our death. And after the experience that I'm sure all of you know well of seeing a person that was ill and seeing a person who was dead and then seeing a holy man in meditation in the forest, 
the Buddha one night, age 27, slipped out of the palace and left his wife, left his son, left his wealth, and with one servant rode out to the edge of the forest, got off his horse, took some shears and cut his hair. Apparently he had beautiful hair. Took off his clothes and naked walked south into the forest. He developed various yogic practices. He studied under teachers who were the best in the land and came to the conclusion they weren't going to get him to where he knew he had to go. He then went into a period of deep asceticism where he literally starved himself. And it is said, as he recounted it, he could put his hand press on his stomach and reach around his spine. Check your girth right now. <laughs> Most of us have very ample girths because we eat too much. Just imagine sitting there with such intense focus that your body begins to just emaciate itself away. He would sit in the graveyards, go for months without bathing, desperately trying to break through the limits of the finite. And then he realized one day that asceticism wasn't going to get him where he knew he needed to go. So he left. There's a very famous story of a maiden tending some cows who saw the Buddha walking. He must have been a total sight. And in a spontaneous act of generosity, she brought him a bowl of milk. And he drank the milk and was nourished. And his disciples who had engaged in ascetic practices, when they saw that, him drinking some milk, they said the Buddha, not called the Buddha, but Siddhartha has lost his way and they left. And nourished by the milk, Siddhartha wandered into a forest again and sat under a Bodhi tree. And there, after 40 days and 40 nights of intense meditation, he gained enlightenment and understood the truth about existence, that it's all empty. It's all impermanent. It's all insubstantial and that we are insatiable for that which is substantial and that which is permanent in an insubstantial, impermanent world. And that is what causes our suffering. But there's a way out of the suffering. It's possible like the monk sitting in that Buddhist temple when I was five years old, it's possible to get to such a place of quiet beyond the material world. That, poof, you enter enlightenment. You enter nirvana. And that is the end of your incarnations. Extraordinary story. Extraordinary story. 
And um, that gave birth to one of the world's great religions. And for 40 years, 45 years after that, he came out of the Bodhi tree experience when he was 35. And for the next 45 years, the Buddha taught that there's a way beyond suffering. And uh, then he passed, uh, he was cremated. And three months after his passing, his disciples met. And um, uh, they recounted his sayings. And those were all codified in what is now known as the Pali Canon. And the essential teaching is that if you want to gain enlightenment, you need to go away into the forest. You need to go away into a monastery. Uh, the Buddhist monastic tradition is the longest continuously operating social system in the world. Buddhist monks have lasted uh, from uh, 500 BC to the present day, uh, 2,600 years. And that monastic tradition, known as the Hinayana tradition, the small vehicle tradition, the Theravada uh, tradition, the way of the elders, was what brought Buddhism uh, first in India, uh, and then it began to spread across Asia, and it began to then mature. And about 500 years after the death of the Buddha, on that full moon in May, there began to emerge social changes in India. And that gave rise to what we now know as the Mahayana tradition, the great vehicle. And it was brought about to a large extent because uh, laity began to embrace Buddhism without going into the monasteries. That was a very interesting development. Buddhism was, was founded on an ascetic practice and principle of leaving that material world, that fly that lights on your face and distracts you. Just get rid of it. Go into the forest and do what the Buddha did. And it's possible for you to gain enlightenment. But as Buddhism spread, more and more people, home keepers, mothers, fathers, townspeople, craftspeople, began to embrace Buddhism. And they didn't want to go into the forest. <laughs> so what began to emerge was the Mahayana tradition that began to emphasize not just emptiness, but that emptiness in samsara, the fly, that which distracts, that which binds us into the material world and the appetites and the ambitions and the jealousies and the rages and the angers, the lusts of the flesh and the pride of life. That that was best dealt with through compassion and through wisdom. And the uh, Narganjana was the great Buddhist wisdom teacher that said emptiness is form, form is emptiness. So you don't go away from the form to gain emptiness. That nirvana and samsara are two sides of the same coin. That it's possible to be an artist or a teacher, a sailor, a farmer, a mother, a father, a brother, a sister. You can exist in samsara and still attain nirvana. 
you can be completely immersed in form and still come to an understanding of emptiness. And that's the great breakthrough that characterized the central tenet of the Mahayana tradition. And out of that emerged this notion of the bodhisattva. Bodhi means awareness. Zattva means being. And that the bodhisattva, because he or she is motivated by compassion and he or she is living in the world, rather than leaving the world, the bodhisattva then makes a vow and says, I will not gain enlightenment until everybody gains enlightenment. If there's no substantiality, if my ego and your ego are just part of the same continuum, your suffering is my suffering. And if there's no separation between you and me, and I'm motivated by love and compassion and wisdom, then I commit myself to your liberation. And in fact, I will make a vow not to enter into ultimate enlightenment until you do. And that's the rise of the bodhisattva uh, in the Mahayana tradition that emerged around the first century AD, so about 500 years after the uh, time of the Buddha in the sixth century BC. And I would just note that that was the time of Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, far, far to the west of India, uh, in the uh, eastern shores of the Mediterranean. It's just worth noting that the emergence of the savior religions in the West, with no discernible connection with the East, happened simultaneously with the rise of the Mahayana tradition uh, in the East. So that this notion of, of someone who gives one's life for everyone, Someone who can say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Seems to have been a function of a general elevation, a general uh, development in human consciousness that occurred simultaneously in different places around the world. It's quite an extraordinary thing to consider. That oftentimes we think, you know, we're developing our lives and we have some breakthrough and then all of a sudden we realize that it's happening all over. That happened to me when I was 18 and I refused the draft. You know, we look back on the Vietnam War and we understand it all in hindsight, but at the time I had no idea. I was just refusing the draft. I wasn't gonna to go to war in Vietnam. And it was only as I began to become more aware and particularly as the years went on, we began to realize people were burning their draft cards all over the United States. It was part of the zeitgeist. So the emergence of the Mahayana tradition uh, was, a, uh, was, a, was a very important development. Uh, in the social and political and spiritual history um, of the human race. Uh, and that's what sets the context for Shanti Deva. Shanti Deva was born 600 years later uh, in the sixth century uh, AD. Uh, and uh, he was like Buddha. Uh, he was the son of a king. 
He was uh, destined uh, to inherit the throne. Uh, he was precocious. Uh, he was handsome. Uh, he was well liked. Uh, and he was deeply, deeply spiritual. His father died. And they built a new throne for the young king. And the night before the coronation, Shanti Deva had a dream. And in that dream, Manjushri, the Buddha of wisdom, came to him and said, My son, there's not room for two of us on the throne. And Shanti Deva woke up and he realized that he should not take the throne. That the Lord Manjushri was king. And so like Buddha thousand years before him, he left the palace, he wandered around and he came to the great university, the Buddhist university of Nalanda in what is modern day Bihar uh, in North East India, uh, not far from uh, uh, Calcutta, uh, if you know that great city. Nalanda was uh, one of the most uh, extensive and sophisticated universities in the ancient world. Uh, it was established in around the fourth century uh, uh, AD, uh, so about 800 years uh, after the Buddhist, uh, the life of the Buddha. Uh, they taught all kinds of, of, of uh, scriptures. They taught medicine. They taught science. They taught astronomy. Uh, they taught government. It was really one of the great ancient universities. And it lasted uh, nearly 900 years till it was completely destroyed and burnt to the ground by the Islamic armies as they conquered India. And it is said that the library smoldered for six months as they burned the books. It's like the burning of the Alexandrian library by the Christians in the fourth and fifth century, and then finally by the Muslim armies in the seventh and eighth centuries, burning the most precious possessions. Can you imagine if we had the Nalanda Library, if we had the books of the Alexandrian Library, how rich our cultures would be now? We have less than 5% of all the works that we know existed in the West, uh, and less than that of the works that we know existed in the East. That's the paucity of our inheritance from antiquity. Shanti Deva came right when Nalanda was at its apogee. People were coming from all over the Buddhist world. And people were uh, alive with knowledge and debate. And Shanti Deva, um, it is said, uh, didn't do much, didn't say much. He wandered around. And it is said that he ate and he slept and he walked around. So his teachers and his uh, classmates considered him a dullard and uh, without any particular merit. And they would say, get his, ask him what his opinion was on something and he'd say, I, I don't know enough. So one day, to trick him and to kind of embarrass him, uh, they got the uh, administration to hold a great ceremony. And they asked Shanti Deva 
to provide some comments, thinking that he would be embarrassed and they would have fun at his expense. And he asked them, he said, well, do you want me to summarize the traditions or would you like something new? And they said, oh, we would love something new. So he said, oh, okay. And the ceremony approached. Shanti Deva stayed mostly in his room. And on the great day, he ascended the dais and delivered in one oration the entire book that we know as the way of the Bodhisattva. And as he completed the work, his oration, Manjushri appeared behind him and both of them slowly ascended into the air and disappeared. The audience, as you might expect, was completely shocked. For they had just heard a level of brilliance in poetic form without peer. Several years later, they found Shanti Deva. And as as soon as they had taken in what had happened, they began to write down what it is that they remembered that he said. And they brought him a manuscript. And he corrected it. And that's the book that we know as the way of the Bodhisattva. Like the Quran, it emerged fully formed. And in Shanti Deva's case, in one oration, the Quran was delivered to Muhammad uh, over uh, nearly 20 years to different sutras. There are various stories of Shanti Deva. There are stories of him wandering into a countryside afflicted by famine taking his begging bowl, stirring his finger into the begging bowl and feeding the multitudes. There's a famous story of, of uh, him entering into a kingdom right at the moment when a Hindu seer was taunting uh, the king with his powers and he could he said he could draw up a mandala in the sky and he defied anybody to dismantle the mandala that he could cause to appear in the sky and was demanding that everybody follow his way. Shanti Deva went into a meditation and before the king and before the Hindu seer, breathed a breath out of his mouth and nostrils that became a great wind. And that great wind shook the trees and emptied the sky of the Hindu apparitions. There's other stories of, of his body being so luminous that sometimes when he would accept water from a peasant or a farmer, they'd spill the water on his hands. The water would sizzle and boil. Such was the heat of the presence of Shanti Deva. 
So this was the man that that brought us uh, this great work that we are uh, now going to consider. I want to summarize some of the main essential uh, teachings today. And then next time, I really want to get textual and go into the actual work. Uh, and I want to uh, make a, a couple of general points uh, about who, who we're dealing with here and what his essential teachings are. For Shanti Deva, nothing is more important than the development of what he calls bodhicitta. We've uh, talked about a bodhisattva, an enlightened being. But Shanti Deva is interested in what he calls bodhicitta, an enlightened mind. What does it take to enlighten a mind? Because our minds are caught up in all kinds of distractions. Remember the fly. How do we get beyond the fly? How do we clear our minds? And in the midst of being completely addicted by the distractions, what is it that wakes us up? That's really a mystery. What wakes us up? What was it in my encounter with the Buddhist monk who never moved, never even knew I was there, never responded to me because he was somewhere else? What was it about that that woke me up, stirred what the Greeks called pothos, the yearning? You know, that's what they say was consuming Alexander the Great. It wasn't ambition. It wasn't conquest. It was pothos, says Plutarch. Yearning. What activates that in a mind, in a heart, in a being? Why is it that most people seem never to be bothered with yearning. Reminds one of Plato's cave, the allegory of the cave. You know, we're all in shackles. We're all looking at the back of the cave. And the elites have lit a fire in the our shadows are projected onto the back of the cave, and we think that's real. We think the fly is real. We think the car, the iPhone, the PhD, ubiquity, anything we are yearning for, we think it's actually real. Shadows on the wall. And then says Plato, against our will, something happens, some trauma, and we begin to wake up. And we realize that the shackles weren't put there by anybody but us. And then we stagger out to the mouth of the cave and we look around and blink and we realize we're looking at the sun for the first time, that those shadows flickering at the back of the cave were mere ephemeral apparitions. And then like the great Mahayana, Plato says, then we have to choose, do we go back into the cave and try to wake other people up who are so attached to the shadows in the back of the cave that they could even kill us to keep us from telling them what the truth is. That's the choice, the profound agonizing choice of the bodhisattva. Once you understand 
what is your obligation to those who do not understand, knowing that in their lack of understanding, their dogmatic certainty about the absolute truth of the shadows flickering in the back of the cave is so strong. As Plato said, they will hang a good man on a tree. So Shanti Deva, right at the beginning of the book, honors that. The subtlety, what wakes people up? But he says, whatever that is, whatever that mysterious act of grace is that gives you even a glimmer that something else besides the apparitions on the back of the cave is real, you grab it with your very soul. Because that is the key to your liberation. And whatever you have to do, do it. Because there's no second best to enlightenment. There's either samsara or there's enlightenment, which leads to his profound notion of the distinction between what he calls ultimate bodhicitta and relative bodhicitta. The Buddha taught us about ultimate bodhicitta, understanding that everything is insubstantial, everything is impermanent. Our insatiability is what causes our suffering, that emptiness comprises all being that there's no separate self. We are all interconnected all the time with everything. And that's why that great uh, understanding of Nargarjuna, that it is emptiness is the cradle of compassion. That once you understand that it's all interconnected, there's no separate self. You embrace everyone everything as your mother because they are all the mother to you. You love your mother, the way you love your mother is the way you should love all beings. And the way the mother loves her children is the way we should embrace all beings. So that's ultimate bodhicitta, just the awareness of the truth of existence. And then says Shanti Deva, there's relative bodhicitta. It's where you are now, <laughs> swatting the fly, <laughs> trying to kill the fly. Think about that for a minute. How many of us, when we see a fly, we want to kill it? Uh, we, 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 we want to just eliminate those distractions. And uh, that's what most of us spend our lives doing. So that when we wake up to that, the relative bodhicitta is ignited when in the grip of samsara, in the grip of the material world, in the grip of trying to swat the fly, we realize another way is possible. And we commit ourselves so that the relative bodhicitta is the aspiration of the seeker to somehow embody what they know theoretically, but have not yet experienced uh, existentially. So, so that is the, 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 the contradiction, the great complexio oppositorum that Shanti Deva wrestles with in the way of the bodhisattva, our aspirational uh, intent to become more and more of who we most essentially are. Because, and this is the second point, samsara, which seems to be our existence, is in fact an illusion. Bodhicitta, clear mind, connected mind, is actually at the deepest level our true self. 
So it's a process of uncovering, of, of, of letting go of that which is uh, ephemeral to that is what is most real. And that's why in the end, uh, as Plato said, all knowledge is not acquisition. All knowledge is a remembering of who we most essentially are. Shanti Deva agrees with that. The third point, which we'll get into more deeply next uh, month, is the way he understands morality. You know, in the West, we tend to have this notion of morality as 10 commandments, the two great commandments delivered by God, uh, and by God, you better obey them or you're gonna go to hell and burn into e in hell for eternity. So the West is built on a morality of guilt. Because there's been an infraction of divine law. The Buddhists don't believe that at all. The Buddhists have this notion of morality that's more, much more framed around the notion of karma, the notion of cause and effect, and that which causes suffering uh, is bad and should be eliminated, and that which causes happiness is good and should be sustained and deepened. But it's very contextual. There's no notions of, of permanence. Nobody's going to hell forever. And even though you descend after your lives into various heavens and various hells, nothing is permanent. Everything's a purification, ultimately to bring you to who you most essentially are as pure mind, undifferentiated from anything else. And that's emptiness is form. Form is emptiness. And out of that emerges compassion for all things and a wisdom that everything is relative to a larger whole. So the notion of, of, uh, of, of morality as being non-judgmental, purely situational, dependent on the enlightenment of our minds, the chitta, the mind, the awareness, so that the entire framework, the entire purpose of the way of the bodhisattva is how do we cultivate that which comes to us almost in a whisper at the beginning while we're looking at the back of the cave. And how do we hold on to it? How do we cultivate it? How do we dispel distractions? And then they come again and we fall down and we do something that's karmically negative. We wear, become aware of it. We get back up, we press forward. And you'll note, those of you who've read the book, note that over and over and over in the book, he's talking about this human life is precious. That's one thing the Buddhists say that can be born a dog, you can be born a horse, you can be born a fish, you can be born an eagle, but no life form is as precious as the human life form, even though they're all interconnected. Why? Because it's the humans that have the biggest opportunity to become enlightened. So that the virtues that one cultivates are the virtues of perseverance, the, the virtues of patience, the virtues of resilience, because we fall, but then we get up. And that is what makes the work so profoundly important in the Buddhist communities. Because those who have studied this work have realized that what Shanti Deva expressed in that oration before he ascended into the ether with Manjushri was that pathway from the first glimmerings 
of who it is that we potentially are, and how we then step by step, day by day, year by year, strip that which is inessential away to what emerges is clear mind, clear heart, so overflowing with compassion that we embrace all beings and then dedicate not only this life, but every lifetime to come to the enlightenment of all until finally, one day, everyone enters nirvana and you are the last person to step foot across the threshold into the pure land. That's Shanti Deva. That's the way of the Bodhisattva. So I'll leave it at that and um, uh, ask the different um, students now to uh, uh, raise their hands and make whatever comment. Anybody wants to make a, uh, a comment or ask a question uh, for the time that we have. Uh, available to us. Um, while you're thinking about it, uh, and the students in particular are preparing their, their uh, remarks, I want to say also that I, uh, next, next week I want to prepare uh, a critique of, of uh, Shanti Deva, from the point of view of a post axial spirituality. And I'll, I'll say something more about this at the end of, uh, of our time today. Uh, but I'm wanting to, with this lecture, to just express my love and appreciation for all things Buddhist and the sublime brilliance of Shanti Deva in the way of the Bodhisattva. But next month, when we really get into the the, the, the textual analysis. I want to do it from the vantage point of, uh, of, um, of uh, a deep critique of uh, some of the ways that he believes enlightenment uh, is gained around the negation of the body, the negation of sexuality, the negation of some of the, uh, what he calls the defiled emotions. So I just want to kind of flag that. Raffaello, how are you? Good to see you again today. Um, Hello, Jim. What would you like to comment or what question would you like to ask? Okay, so I will admit that uh, my comment and my question was totally in the line of your last words because throughout my life, my relationship with Buddhism has been a complex one um, where I got inspired by the Buddhist texts and by also... I spent quite some time in Thailand, so also by the Buddhist practices that I came in contact with. But I always had um, in me a germ of critique as well of the system that after all in, in many of its presentations is a dualistic system of samsara and nirvana, of uh, in a way, um, you know, like a, a negation of a certain part of the human experience. So as I'm reading Shanti Deva, I am already, you know, kind of like feeling both the inspiration and a form of critique there. But I won't go there because you will go there. So there will be time to speak about that. And I will try to focus and to um, zoom in more into one particular aspect. And um, the aspect that um, for some reason, is, you know, is, is interesting for me and I would like to hear comments on is the way that Shantideva, um, I'm, I'm kind of almost finished with the book, so I haven't finished it completely, but uh, the way that he uses the defiled emotions or some of the defiled emotions, particularly fear and anger, as actually propellers into the path of cultivating uh, bodhicitta. So it's very interesting because 
quite a few paragraphs of the way of the Bodhisattva are actually, or seem to me, uh, meant to elicit strong emotions, to elicit fear, to elicit um, passionate warrior-like spirits. Um, for example, he takes quite a bit of time uh, in describing the hells and the torments that um, you know we will go through, or you know, a human being will go through after death. And also, he seems to me, and I, I want to see whether I'm, I'm understanding, he seems to actually make space for a certain quality of anger towards one's own stupidity, one's own capacity to uh, be deluded. So it's almost like, it's interesting for me because when I um, read Shantideva, I don't see the monk that you saw, Jim, you know, in total quiet, still meditation with the fly, but I see someone battling and struggling and like, you know, fighting the illusions that the five, it's a very passionate um, image that comes to me rather than a sort of like quiet and still uh, meditative image. So I would like to, to offer that as a point of reflection. Well, thank you so much. Uh, because you're hitting on something uh, that I've been pondering a lot. I've been, I've been reading a, a book um, uh, that uh, Claire gave me uh, called uh, When the Body Says No by a Hungarian doctor called Gabor Mate. And uh, for anybody who really wants a, 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 a juxtaposition and a potential critique of Shanti Deva, uh, and the defiled emotions, uh, I would urge you to read when the body says no. Because he, in this work, talks about the way stress induces disease. And that many of the diseases that are caused from breast cancer to all kinds of different cancers, Alzheimer's, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, et cetera, et cetera. A major contributing factor is the repression of anger, the repression of, of emotions of all sorts. And so I think this is what I want to explore next time. And thank you for, for raising it. I want to really explore what we are now learning about the importance of expressing emotions, expressing anger, expressing defiance, expressing fear, expressing anxieties of all kinds that are actually healthy and that this repression, no, I must not be angry, that's a negative emotion. I must not show any dependence. I can do this. Uh, and we repress those basic instincts that are considered bad, but then fester in the body in a way that causes disease. And I'll be going into more detail on it, but it's just worth flagging that the pathway of the bodhisattva as I look at it more and more, I'm beginning to seriously question, particularly the negation of the body. You know, in, in ubiquity, we teach embodiment as one of the fundamental um, ways of being in the world. We're not embodied. We're all in our heads because we're, we've, we've, we've endured, you know, several thousand years of a, of a religious tradition that negated the body negated the woman, negated nature. And Buddhism did that along with everyone else. So that the negation of the body, the negation of the, the emotions, the negation of the female, the negation of nature are all part of a complexio that may seem right from the vantage point of an ascetic on generally his own, but also her own. Um, uh, uh, you know, the Buddha resisted three times 
allowing uh, women to become priests, nuns. And even after he allowed it, uh, he said that the highest nun is lower than the lowest monk. So that, that almost misogynistic, um, uh, uh, thematic of the axial religions generally uh, infused itself through Shanti Deva's work. And I think it's important for us to hold that aspect, that's that that's that the kind of shadow underbelly, uh, along with the extraordinary grandeur and brilliance of what he was seeking uh, to um, to get us to understand, so that we have a fuller notion of what our responsibilities are uh, in a post patriarchal world, where we have an extraordinary opportunity to recreate the world again, which is what as many students know, is what I keep driving at in my lectures in Chartres and my various um, missives around what I believe is the, the need for the human race to move beyond the axial religions. Uh, and that includes Buddhism, that includes Hinduism, that includes Christianity, Judaism, Islam, because that those predicates, um, I think, um, compromised their effectiveness um, and limited humanity for thousands of years. And it's our responsibility uh, and indeed extraordinarily important historic opportunity uh, to move uh, beyond that. So anyway, I'll leave it at that, but that's just sort of a taster. So Raffaello, thank you so much for activating that impulse and I'm very eager to hear what you have to say next time. <laughs> But let's, uh, let's turn to some other students because we don't have that much time left. So we got Laura, Vivian, and Linda uh, have raised their hands. So we'll start with you, Laura. Welcome. Thank you, Raffaello. Thank you. This is such an interesting discussion. Um, yeah, where to comment? Certainly, um, actually, the paper I'm writing now with Kabir, that's where I found myself going, was exactly what we're talking about. And uh, when Raphael was mentioning the sword, uh, um, it's, that's how I hear that, that slashing our way through the delusion and the, you know, an embodiment of the feminine, the body, the the birthing, the if we're bringing spirituality into culture, the embodiment, we can't be ignoring the body and these exactly. these emotional patterns that, yeah, they aren't us, but we've come through a lineage. Like my spiritual teacher Thomas Hubel said, we're born in dark lakes. We're born with generational trauma. Where you know, there's many studies of that. And I feel like we don't have a framework. We have the traditions, as you say, all of them have contributed to our denial of the body. And so there's an uprising uh, in our psyches and in, in, in oppressive systems, even politically in Europe. And I was just reading an article on our, she's right here from Ladysmith, Vancouver Island, uh, Pamela Anderson. She's a, she's a former um, uh, Playboy girl, play, a poster playgirl, and, and she's an actress, and she is really making an impact in European politics. I mean, who'd have thought? So I feel like there's a lot being turned, you know, upside down so that we can birth something new. So I feel like that it's so exciting on the one hand and so unnerving in another because we don't really know where we're going. We don't have a, we can't look behind us to, as you say, the axial traditions because they're all sort of guilty of the same thing in, in downplaying our embodiment. So with this book, I mean, I ha I've only really dipped into um, 
several of the different chapters, I have to say I liked the flow of the chapter titles. So I made little notes. I, I, so because from my perspective, what I hear in the titles is the first one, the excellence of the bodhicitta, I hear, a, I hear praise. And I feel that's a really good way to open our hearts and be available. So praising. And then I hear confession. So that's like, okay, where have I, where have I gone sideways? You know, some honest looks there. And then there's the taking hold of bodhicitta. Then there's glimmers. You might call it relative momentariness, I think he calls it. There's kind of glimmers of something else, right? So that's to get us interested. And then there's, there's carefulness. Like there's no hurry here, go slow. You know, this is, this is new territory. So these are what I'm hearing in these titles. And then vigilant introspection. So that's again, dipping down into a deeper examination of self and the culture we live in. And then patience. And then I hear depth. I hear a dropping into depth with patience. And that's the dis beginning of the disappearance of the separate self, because the no self has eternal patience. There's no problem. And then I'm just about done. And then diligence uh, is again, application. Like it's okay, so I've had this deep experiences and I have to be really diligent that I don't fall back into my old patterns as I'm bringing this out into my life. So I hear diligence is application and then meditative concentration i hear more depth and then wisdom chapter around finding root it rooting itself through me in my life and that's the second to last chapter and then the last one number 10 is dedication and then i hear more praise so it starts out as praise and it ends as praise so i thought there was just a beautiful flow through those 10 chapters that I really could track. I could track it and it was very pleasing to be able to do that. Even though, yeah, I do disagree with a lot of the, the back eddies he gets stuck in, but that was the consciousness of the time too. Yeah, so anyway. Yes, well, thank you, uh, Laura. It's, uh, you're, what you're saying is absolutely correct the brilliance and the sensitivity uh, and the uh, uh, exquisite way that he expresses these very subtle nuanced truths is just sublime. It's mm -hmm. just sublime. Uh, and um, he was speaking out of a culture, um, as we've noted, uh, Raffaello, you and, and I and, and others, uh, that was profoundly crippled uh, in relationship to the very wholeness that they were wanting us to achieve. Right. And, uh, uh, and that contradiction uh, is something that's, that's, that's really um, worth exploring. Uh, so um, uh, thank you for that. Just looking at the titles of the, of the various chapters, it's very profoundly organized yes. and one of the reasons why it's so sublime is that it wasn't sort of like the bible that was written over centuries and centuries and centuries but again as i said more like the quran you know it emerged almost fully formed right at the beginning so you get the the pure genius of the shanti deva mind as opposed to the book of Genesis, for example, which is written over like a 500 year period <laughs> and have all these redactions and internal contradictions and different words, Yahweh and, and Elohim and, you know, different layers, uh, the Deuteronomist, the priestly layers and the Yahweh's layers and, and, and all of that in the, in the text. That's part of the beauty of, of uh, Shantideva. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, thank you for that. And, and that uh, one other thing I would note, you know, is um, Thomas Hubble's notion of generational trauma. Mm -hmm. That is so true. We're all in the grip of literally generations. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I read a, a book on this recently. I can't remember the, 
the title now, but it was um, uh, just pointing out that in our DNA, you know, are the sins of the fathers. Mm-hmm. Great line in, in Genesis, the sins of the uh, uh, fathers are visited unto the children of the seventh generation. And uh, uh, how we extract ourselves from that is not, is not an easy task. Mm-hmm. Definitely not an easy task. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, John, you had something to say. Oh, now, John, we, we got to get you to un- unmute. How's that? There we go. All right. Adjust my camera a little bit. So uh, the thing that is um, really resonating with me is this idea of generational trauma um, combined with uh, the idea of, of Plato of rediscovering the knowledge within us. You know, I, I, in addition to this course, I took the course with Ann Baring, uh, long journey to a new story. And the theory I'm developing is that we're actually on a long journey to our old story, that the period of the great mother was a period when we weren't shackled at all. Hello, hello, hello. And that we are engaged in this tremendous hard work uh, perseverance, patience, resilience, diligence, vigilance. We have to really work at unshackling ourselves to get back to the time. We know this instinctively. You said that the sins of the father are in our DNA, but I, I, I think the, the great, the era, the lunar era is also within us, right? And, and that the shackles came in the solar era to you know, to bring in some of what she talked about. I don't have those notes in front of me, so I hope I'm saying it okay. But the idea that we have to unshackle ourselves is, uh, it, it takes us work, but what, what we're trying to get back to is something that we instinctively know and was lost through a kind of trauma that she talks about that was not just generations ago, but, you know, thousands of years ago. I think it was 12,500 BC is where she points to this transition uh, so that we still have within us instinctively a connection to the lunar era. It's just that we didn't have to work at it at all when we, when we lived in that era. To get back to it, we have to undo the shackles of, of uh, patriarchy. Um, and, and that's why it takes such hard work. The, again, the, the words that keep coming out about vigilance and patience and uh, that, as you said, Jim, extracting ourselves, which wasn't necessary at all in the lunar era, is not easy. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's a very good point. You know, we, we remember our pure self. And as you're pointing out, we remember back to the time of the great mother when we were bonded with uh, with nature, uh, we were bonded with the feminine, and um, we had a completely different um, structure of consciousness that began to be lost as we moved into the agricultural uh, revolution. So it's not only a personal remembering, it's a cultural, historic, remembering. Um, that's a very, very important point. And by the way, I just want to comment uh, to everybody on John's post paper from the last trimester. He wrote a really brilliant post paper and, and, and brought something that I hadn't thought of. You know, when we choose the books every year, sometimes they're a little random. And uh, uh, But John was pointing out that uh, Naomi Klein's work, No Is Not Enough, and Kabir's Poetry turned me to gold with Andrew Harvey. Um, we're actually two sides of the same coin. That Naomi Klein, the outer revolution, and Kabir, the inner revolution. And uh, I was so pleased at that observation, John. <laughs> it made us seem wiser than we are. <laughs> well, you know, Jim, and then you pointed out, I, I was 
all absorbed in the sequence. We have to do one before the other. And you pointed out that it's dialectical, that we continue. The, the outer work gets better when the inner work gets better. Yeah. And the inner work, we're driven more to it as we see the, the need for it. So you, you helped me really see that it's an ongoing dialectic. And so... Yeah, it was a good, it was a good interchange. I mean, you wrote a really great paper, really great paper. I just want everybody to know that. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. Okay, Vivian, let's try you again. Can you hear me now? Oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay, Thank you, Georg. Oh, um, so that's really interesting what you just said about the, about the outer and the inner um, work, because one thing that, um, that I feel very strongly about is the entropy that's happening right now with the chaos around climate change is going to push us towards uh, a traumatic um, necessity to all evolve simultaneously. Um, it's an existential threat that's, you know, challenging the entire human race, right? So I think that it's, um, I think that it's changing us. I think it's changing our DNA. And um, I also, you know, really feel like that, um, I was, I'm, I'm reading Rick Tarnas's book at the same time that I'm, I'm you know, studying um, these other um, books too. And um, what is the relate, the, the, um, I'm curious about Christ's natal chart and Buddha's natal chart. Now that you, you said that about the, you know, that, that, it, that they brought something into the culture um, simultaneously in different places, and was there a impetus that you know to birth that from um, a higher plane, in uh, so to speak, from a from a astrological standpoint? I'd be curious about that. Oh, and uh, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, one of the things that um, I'm I have in my in my brain that I have no clue where this came from is um, the arc of the universe is moved by humans heartbreak i don't know where that comes from i'm just saying that that's a theory that i have that that as we um go through trauma and our hearts open um or close um that it pushes it pushes that um open somehow i just have this thing and as far as the the book in the um the first chapter I listened to, I've got this on Audible also, was oh. diligence because I felt like that was the thing that I needed the most from <laughs> from this because I just I wimp out on things so easily. I just like okay, I'm not interested in that anymore. So I listened to diligence and I just really I really like that. I've listened to it about six times now. Um, to to be persistent in this, you know, moving the arc of the of the universe towards justice is is my inner work as well as the outer work, I think, is where we are. But anyway, that's just my, my um, observations. Well, thank you. I, I think you're, all three of them are very important. I, I can't comment on the astrological aspects. I'll leave that to Rick to in, uh, in Chartra. But those of you who were part of the Chartra community call um, last month, in April, Amazing. heard him give an, a, a commentary on Donald Trump's birth chart and the birth chart of the United States and how they overlap. Yep. And I would just point out for all of you who, who uh, are listening that weren't part of that, but it's worth going up on our YouTube channel and just getting the April community call, a Chartres community call with Rick Tarnas because he points out that the United States is experiencing this year, yeah, last couple of years, our Pluto return. Oh. You know, when you're 28, you have your Saturn return, you come into your adulthood. Well, Pluto is the god of hell. <laughs> the United States, 248 years after the Declaration of Independence in 1776, is experiencing its first Pluto return. And it ju juxtaposes with a, uh, a Pluto Uranus square, which is revolutionary in its 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 impact, uh, and the extraordinary characteristic of Trump's birth chart um, is his he has a chart that lets 
that indicates he gets away with things. Hmm. And he's about ready to get away without even being impeached. That's how out of touch the Democrats are. But it's consistent with his chart. It's really an amazing thing. And I, so we're going to be spending, if those of you who have any possibility at all of coming to Chartres this July 7 to 13, we've got Rick there for one week. And we're going to be looking at the astrology of the world, the astrology of the United States, the astrology of Trump, and what it means that we're in such a period of, of extraordinary uh, uh, turbulence. Um, now, in, in terms of your second point, um, that the universe moves by heartbreak. I really love that, Vivian. And what immediately sprang to mind is those great lines of Aeschylus, the, the Greek playwright, um, that lived around exactly at the time of the Buddha uh, and considered the earliest of the great tragedians of ancient Greek. And it, uh, the, he had a, a, a line, drop by drop, pain that cannot forget falls upon the heart hmm. until in our despair against our will wow. comes wisdom by the awful grace of God. That's it. Drop by drop, pain that cannot forget falls upon the heart until in our despair against our will comes wisdom by the awful grace of God. So this notion of heartbreak, this notion of suffering, this notion of, of the pothos, this yearning for a better world, in its own mysterious way, moves the universe. That's it. It moves the universe, and I that's think, why- I think it actually creates the dark energy. It, you know, I actually, I, I'm going to metaphysics here. I think it actually is what creates it. So it, it could well be. It could well be. Why but, not? Uh, so anyway, thank you for your uh, thank you for your comments. Um, uh, but I want to uh, just take a a moment uh, to uh, to to summarize um, uh, this work. You know, as with all great works, they're contextualized within the constraints and awarenesses of their time. And uh, that's as true of Shanti Deva as it, as it has been of every great work. We're all illumined to certain truths and we're blinded by our cultural conditionings and um, moral immaturities, both personal and cultural. So I want to um, uh, state that as we come to a close, because as we go into a deeper critique of Shanti Deva next time, from the point of view of embodiment, women's liberation, the ecology imperative of uh, commanded now by climate change to honor nature, we will be uh, criticizing genius. And uh, just like Einstein never made it to the unified field theory, uh, so Shanti Deva didn't make it to complete enlightenment. Um, but he tried. He gave it his best shot. And that work has endured now over a thousand years. Uh, and it is the work that the Dalai Lama says has taught him more about compassion uh, than any other work that he has has read. So I, I want to honor these great minds and these great souls that are the giants upon whose shoulders we sit, uh, and to say that the the criticisms are not meant to um, undermine that greatness at all but rather to contribute to the awakening that is happening in our day, that's allowing us to see farther and to understand more deeply precisely because we're, we're, we're sitting on their shoulders. Precisely because we're sitting on their shoulders. So I'll bring it to a close. Uh, thank you all. Um, we'll meet, um, one month from now, the second Tuesday of June, and we'll dive into the actual text of, 
of Shanti Deva uh, and uh, have our discussion. And if anybody wants to read uh, an extraordinary work that is a companion to Shanti Deva, uh, it's uh, Gabor Mate, G A B O R M A T E, Hungarian name, When the Body Says No. So you uh, doctoral students in particular, I want to assign that as uh, your extracurricular material for next month. <laughs> it's well worth getting. It's a it's brilliant, brilliant uh, work on what happens when anger, fear, anxiety is not dealt with creatively, expressively, and with moral maturity. It's quite an extraordinary work. All right, everyone. We'll talk next week and uh, next month, and then students obviously get on the uh, Ubiquity um, uh, platform to share your comments in the forum. Bye, everyone.